What power level is your deck? Give me a number from one to 10. That's easy enough, right? This is the best way that we have to ensure that we're on equal footing before we start a game of Commander. There are myriad articles, videos, and podcasts talking about how you can express your deck's power level in one number. Can we express power level in a number like this? If we can, is it useful? I'm Jim, I'm your spike on the mic, and today we're talking about power levels in Commander. At first glance, talking about power levels on a scale of 1 to 10 seems pretty straightforward. The 1 to 10 scale is intuitive. We all know that 1 is the least powerful deck you can bring to a table, and 10 is the most powerful. Easy, right? Everything that exists in the Commander universe is contained within these boundaries. If it were that easy, I probably wouldn't be talking about it right now. There are a number of things that complicate our ability to talk about power level. Some of them are rooted in biases, some are based in ignorance, and others are just rooted in misunderstanding. I'm going to do my best to outline the issues that I see in the power level discussion, and closer to the end of the video, I'm going to offer some alternatives that I think are helpful. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, and this is just my opinion. I do think, though, that this is a pretty good jumping off point for a discussion. If you have something to add, hit me up in the comments. I love reading your comments. First up, I want to talk about the theoretical ceiling and the floor of the format. I say theoretical because I don't actually know if it's possible to quantify power level in any meaningful, objective way. But we can pretty easily make relative statements like this. Any given pre-constructed commander deck is going to be more powerful than a deck with Lord of Tressorhorn and 99 Mountains. Lord of Tressorhorn and 99 Mountains is probably pretty close to the floor of the format. Even if you're somehow able to cast it by your opponents donating blue and black mana sources to you, casting Lord of Tressorhorn will cost you two life, draw an opponent two cards, and you'll have to sacrifice it before you can do anything useful. There might be something worse like Phage and 99 Wastes, but I don't think this is something worth debating. As a community, our concept of a 1 is pretty accurate. When we talk about the ceiling of the format, though, there's a lot more variation in what's considered a 10. For this part of the discussion, I'm going to make the assumption that the CEDH online meta has a pretty solid grasp of the one or two strategies that are the most powerful things you can do in the format. It's possible that there's something sitting out there that's undiscovered, especially with the absolute deluge of powerful and unique effects that have been added to the format in the last year. If something like that does exist, though, it's likely only marginally better than what's available right now, so it won't significantly affect our concept of where the objective ceiling is. To talk about the top end of the format accurately, though, you have to have a pretty solid concept of what's possible. Most people don't play or even watch games at the top end of the format. They're not online debating things like slot efficiency or meta positioning or hypergeometric distributions. So the tendency is to draw a line at the most powerful thing that they're aware of. This could be anything. It could be their friend's Phoenix Eater of the Dead Turbo Mill deck. It could be a nasty Narset Turns deck at FNM. Or it could be the Tattoo of a Landfall deck Pleasant Kenobi played that one time at Magic Fest. If you pencil those decks in as a 10, you'll make those simple relative comparisons and say that your Selesnya Tokens deck is a fair bit worse than them, but you've put some thought and intention into building it. It's functional, so there's no way it'll get a failing grade of 5 or less. It's super easy to split the difference and call your deck a 7. When you run into people who have a different and higher concept of the ceiling of the format, they're making the same relative comparisons. They know that Phoenix Eater of the Dead is a fair bit worse than something like Aloro Doomsday, and even that is a fair bit lower than the absolute ceiling of the format. With a higher ceiling in mind, the Phoenix deck might land at a 7, which pushes your Selesnya Tokens deck down to a 5 or a 6. What's happening here is called anchoring. We instinctively rely on our past experience playing against powerful decks to form a set of expectations. When we play against people who use the same language to set expectations that are anchored in a different frame of reference, that's when we end up with friction and social conflict. If emotions get a little elevated, we might even be tempted to cling to that anchor and assume someone's trying to deceive us, rather than confront the idea that the Commander universe might be a little bigger than we think it is. Let's pretend for a second that there's an objective unit of measurement that we can use to measure the power of a deck, like a Commander equivalent of horsepower. How does horsepower increase as you move along our 1 to 10 scale? Is the difference between a 1 and a 2 the same as the difference between a 9 and a 10? 
There's a few ways that this can shake out, but here are the most common ones I've seen in my travels. The first up is a power level that increases at a steady rate throughout the scale. As you go up each step on the power level scale, you're increasing that unit of power by an equal amount. If you're watching this on YouTube, it looks like this. The second is a power level that increases at a decreasing rate. This means that as you get into the higher numbers on the scale, the decks are more similar to each other power level wise than the decks lower down. The opposite of that is a power level that increases at an increasing rate. This means that as you get into the higher numbers, you see bigger and bigger leaps of power at each level. These are entirely valid interpretations of the power level scale. In fact, I did an informal poll on Twitter to see if people favored one over the others. Each answer corresponds to one of the shapes I described earlier, and it looks like the results are pretty evenly split. With this question, I don't think that it's really important to say which one is the most popular interpretation, but I do think it's important to know that there is a split and that can cause friction. Even if we're all in agreement about where the floor and the ceiling of the format are, approaching a power level discussion with a different concept of the shape of the scale can still cause conflict. If I think power level increases at a decreasing rate and you think it increases at an increasing rate, there can be a pretty big difference in what we each think a six represents. One thing about the different scale shapes that occurs to me is how they offer different amounts of utility to people who tend to play at a particular power level. If you play at a lower power level, a scale that increases at a decreasing rate offers you the ability to make real distinctions that will impact your play experience. Once you get up to the nines and the tens of the world though, the distinctions become essentially meaningless. I think this really strikes at the heart of what the power level scale is for though. We use it as a tool to match people together in the hopes that they'll be able to have fun playing a game of Commander. When the Command Zone approached this topic, I think Josh Lee Kwai put it really well. Sometimes you're going to mismatch the power levels a little bit. Also, I don't think, like if I say, hey, I'm playing a six, the expectation is not that everyone else plays a six. Right. The expectation is that nobody plays a 10 and nobody plays a one. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to match exact power levels. What you're trying to do is get in a reasonable ballpark so that nobody just gets completely stomped. But if somebody's like, hey, I've got a four, a six and a four can be in the same pod together. It doesn't do us a lot of favors to get hung up on specific rankings because the reality is that people are generally comfortable with some amount of power level disparity in their games. A five can have a great game with a six and maybe even an acceptable game with a seven. We use it colloquially to get ourselves in the right neighborhood. Of course, this is all contingent on the idea that we agree about where the ceiling of the format is and the shape of the scale. If we can't agree on that, my five could be miles away from your seven. If we want to overcome any issues that a 10 point power level scale provides, maybe we need to take a step back and focus on what we actually want to accomplish. When people ask what power level the table's at, what they're really looking for is a general idea of people's gameplay expectations. The weird thing is with all this talk about power level, I think we're ignoring a bunch of other expectations that people have when they sit down at a table. Take for example this comment that we got on our Sphinx of the Second Sun Better Know a Combo video a few weeks back. These infinite combos are the worst way to play the game. Nerdy Game Breakers. Our friend here isn't likely to have a good time if someone sits down at their table with any kind of infinite combo, at any power level. They subscribe to the idea that combos sidestep some unspoken rule of magic, but I sure don't. This is the kind of thing that doesn't get captured in a single number from 1 to 10. So if I restrict my conversations to that number, I'm setting myself up for conflict with some amount of players who think like this YouTube commenter. Turns out there's a bunch of things that aren't power level that can impact our ability to enjoy a game. If you do a little self-reflection, I'm sure you can come up with a laundry list of things that might ruin a game for you. Maybe it's an unfortunate social interaction where somebody gets salty when you target them. Maybe it's someone relentlessly milling you or playing too many counter spells. What about stacks? You can play resource denial without increasing the power level of your deck. But as we talked about in a previous episode, stacks can be a really hot button issue. Conversely, if you think about it, you can probably come up with a list of things that make you walk out of a game pumping your fist because you know that you're going to be telling that story for years to come. What does that look like for you? Is it a dramatic shift in power where you snatched victory from the claws of defeat? Did you spend an hour analyzing an intricate tapestry and pull the exact thread that would make it all unravel? If you're having trouble coming up with a list for yourself for either the good or the bad, 
Think about games you've played in the past. What did you like? What didn't you like? Push past the in-game mechanics if you need to and think about how you felt, how other people acted, and what was said. Once you've got your list, try to distill it down so it's as simple as possible. No more than two or three sentences. You want this to be an elevator pitch for the most enjoyable game you can possibly play. Here's a couple examples that are inspired by people I know and play with. These are notable people in the Commander community, so try to guess who they are in the comments below. If you're right, I'll put a heart next to your comment. I'm all about the narrative of the game. I like to imagine leading my troops into a battle that will determine the fate of the multiverse. I hate mill and stacks because they make me feel like my time is being wasted. And I often get lost in conversations while I'm playing. Do you know who it is? Here's another one. I don't really care who wins. I deliberately play a little less interaction in my decks, and I play a little loose sometimes because I love seeing things escalate to an overwhelming crescendo. I tend to check out when people take the game too seriously. Here's one last one. I get a lot of satisfaction from marveling at what I've built. I want to see my finely tuned machine work perfectly, and I know it inside and out. I hate playing against Chaos decks because they divorce my in-game actions from what really ends up happening. In my opinion, if you could get a lot of these thesis statements from people, you could probably easily group them together in three to five categories. These categories would describe groups of players that are likely to have a good time when they play against each other. You could give each category a snappy name to allow players to self-identify easily and have a much easier time matchmaking in pods with strangers. I think there's a lot of benefits to this, but here's just a few. Because named categories like this don't imply a hierarchy of importance, players are much more likely to be honest when they describe themselves. This sidesteps one of the major failings we talked about previously, where nobody wants to give themselves a failing grade. In fact, there's no failing grades here at all. If you're an LGS owner or you run events for commander players, this would give you a much easier way to set expectations for the events that you run. The descriptions for these player satisfaction profiles would give you words and phrases to use in your public messaging to set expectations for players before they even show up to an event, which in turn helps you avoid exposing players to miserable experiences that might prevent them from coming back. You've got the idea, right? The good and the bad, the exciting and the miserable. Good. Next time you sit down with a table at a stranger and they ask what kind of magic you want to play, tell them. I'm going to talk a lot more about issues tangential to power level in the future, but that's good for today. If you could do me a huge favor, hit me up in the comments with your commander thesis statement, your raison d'etre. If I get enough of them, maybe I'll actually be able to build a few profiles and outline them in a future video. While you're at it, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you're not already. I'm Jim, I'm your spike on the mic, and thanks for talking power level with me today. Hey, thanks for checking out the Spike Feeders on YouTube. If you're not subscribed yet, make sure you click that subscribe button. And you can click this link to check out our other great videos.